All right. Good morning, everyone. Today is Friday, 1st of October. And welcome to the class. Uh, I've just, um, I just turned, um, started the recording and started the, yeah, the recording's on. So this lecture will be recorded. Okay, good. Okay, good. Let's just take a moment to pray together. Then we will get our class started. Could somebody lead us in prayer? Anybody could unmute your mic. Just pray with the class. Um, we'll get started. Anybody? Okay, who wants to? Right, let's go ahead. Um, Can I? Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this uh, beautiful time that you've given us, Father Lord, spending time in your presence, um, Lord, worshiping you, Father Lord. Yes, Father, learning from your word. Father, we invite you, Holy Spirit, into our midst, Father Lord, that you teach us, Lord, that you guide us, Father Lord, that you, uh, Lord, inspire, Lord, our faith, Father I'm Lord. Kidding. Yes, Father Lord, may it grow, Lord, may it grow, Father Lord, uh, that I'm we may be able to, Father, move forward, Father, not to hold I'm on kidding. to things, that are in the past, Father, but to lay hold of which, Lord, that you have prepared for us, Father, Lord. Yes, Lord, thank you and praise you. I pray, Father, for Pastor Arshish, Lord, we thank you and praise you, Father, Lord, uh, in all the ways that you are anointing him and empowering and equipping him, Father, Lord. We pray, Lord, let your very word be spoken through him, Father, and you bless him abundantly, Lord. I pray for each and every one in the session and even who are th those who are yet to join, Father, Lord. I pray that you bring them, Lord. I pray that you draw us nearer to you, Father, Lord. May the, or whatever principles that we learn, Father Lord, may it take root, be established in our hearts, Father Lord, that it become a lifestyle for us, Father Lord. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' precious name. We pray, Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank you. So we are continuing our study on the topic of faith, and uh, last week we. Uh, we talked about the basis, uh, sorry, that um, nurturing our faith, how we nurture, uh, some, some simple steps to nurture our faith. And then we started talking about the basis for strong faith. It's, uh, we just um, kind of started going into that, estab establishing um, truths, that we need to be <clears throat> really firm and really strong in so that uh, we can then operate from a place of faith. So we talked about, you know, truths that, that we need to keep in our hearts, that we need to be firmly established in, in order to uh, operate in faith. So I'm just going to quickly review that, and then we're going to move forward and talk about some simple practices that we maintain in our lives to uh, keep, you know, to develop strong faith and to maintain strong faith. So let's just review. So we talked about truths that undergird strong faith. One, we have to be established in the integrity of God's word. That means you and I, we say, God, this is what I'm putting my whole life on, your word. The integrity of your word, I believe it, and I'm living by it. Your word is truth, right? So that's the first thing that we 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 you know we cast our whole lives on the promise of God. We completely rely. We completely depend on the word of God. What God has spoken. Second, we said we are established in the finished work on the cross in Christ's finished work on the cross. That means we look. Uh, at what Jesus did for us on the cross, and we believe it. So the work has been done, and we are living 
as a beneficiary uh, uh, or, uh, of, of what Jesus did on the cross. We're just going to receive that and walk in it. We believe that everything Jesus paid for on the cross is ours. And the devil has no right to keep it away from us. So we are established in the finished work of Christ on the cross. The third we talked about is to be established in our identity in Christ. And uh, you know we are studying this in a in a in a in a separate course which we have uh, on Tuesdays. We're talking about our uh, being established in it. That this is what who I am in Christ. This is what God has made me to be in Christ. This is my identity. This is my inheritance, and I'm going to live out of that. So we are established in it because again, that's what God has done for us. God has done for us. He gave us his word. He did the work on the cross and he made us who we are in Christ. Everything God's done for us. Number four, we are established in the reality of the work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who you know, makes the word good in our lives today. And he, you know, he's at work in us, empowering us. He's at work through us. Uh, so we be depending on him. Him. It's not our strength, not our abilities. It's not our, you know, our uh, um, capabilities that matter. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that matters. And so we are utterly reliant on him, dependent and confident on what he can do through us. And number five, we said we are established in the authority of the name of Jesus. So when we, all, uh, when we use the name of Jesus, we are actually exercising spiritual authority. We are saying, uh, you know, I'm standing here in, the, in, in, in his place on his behalf to do what he would do if he were here himself. So every time we say in Jesus' name, that's what we are saying. I'm representing him. I'm standing here on his behalf to do what he would do if he were here. So that's the authority that's given to us in that name. And so when we use the name of Jesus, we, we should expect the kind of results Jesus would, that would come in the life and ministry of Jesus. Same thing. So we are established in these five, um, we're just referring to them as foundational truths. Uh, this, this is what God has done, and we are settled in it. Nothing's going to shake us. Then, so this is, you know, we talk about how to develop strong faith. So you're established in this truth. So what do you do is you constantly go over these truths over and over again, right? It's not enough to say, well, I heard it, you know, two years ago. Well, keep hearing it, keep listening to it, keep studying it, keep feeding yourself with it. And 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 the fact is every time you revisit a theme, a topic, you keep learning something. You know, for example, uh, this truth on our identity in Christ, I used to preach it almost 40 years ago, you know, as a teenager. So I started preaching that when I was 13, 14. Uh, the subject of faith, I started teaching faith when I was 13 and 14. You know, and I remember I even conducted a seminar here in Bangalore, in one of the churches, in an Ang Anglican church in Mark's Cathedral. You know, we rented that building for three days and I did a whole uh, a series on faith and a series on identity in Christ in that uh, building. And this was way back as a teenager. And here, you know, 40 years later, I'm still teaching the same things. But there's a huge difference that each time, you know, I, I, I go back to God's word and study on the same subject of our identity in Christ, on on faith, on the name of Jesus. We'll just go back and study. This is new things I learned, new revelation, new understanding that takes, that, you know, helps me take another step uh, in my journey. So it doesn't matter if, if we've been on this, on this thing for 40 years, it's still we are learning, we're still discovering. And so uh, what I just want to encourage all of us is, you know, Go back to, you know, keep revisiting these truths. Uh, keep feeding your spirit. You know, it's like uh, the food we eat, you know, uh, just depending on which part of the world you are and what what, what is your 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 favorite dish. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, I'm just thinking, okay, uh, you know, we have a dish called biryani. So 
biryani maybe we first started eating as, as little kids you know but you never stop eating the same biryani you, you know you decades decades later you're still eating the same food and you still enjoy it uh, the same thing here with with the word of god the, the the big difference is the next time you eat that there's greater revelation there's greater enjoyment greater insight that god gives you so you know we should never come to that point where we think oh i know the subject no uh, there's a lot we don't know yet and as we go back and study the scriptures and and look at those words the, the text to the scripture and feed on it new revelation comes new understanding comes so these five foundational truths the integrity of the word of god the finished work of christ on the cross our identity in christ the uh, what was that number four i said was uh, the power of the holy spirit and the authority of jesus name you keep feeding yourself with it over and over and over again right so it never ends it never ends and all of these you know these same truths like i said i've been on it for 40 years just studying it feeding on it but each time we revisit it's so amazing right so go back and feed, keep feeding yourself on it. Now, now we go into, so all these five foundational truths, um, like you know, I think we point, uh, last week we mentioned it, that these are things God has done for us. He's given it to us. We're just embracing them. But then there are practices that we can do, which we are going to really emphasize on. Uh, which will help us walk in strong faith, right? And what are those practices? Uh, I'm just we're just going to share them here, and then some of them we will elaborate uh, uh, further. Number one is to always declare God's word. Always declare God's word. So us speaking the word of God must be just our way of life. Right. No, uh, and I just quoted one verse here. In the next chapter, we're going to expand on this very clearly. We're going to look at Old Testament scripture and New Testament scripture that teach us about declaring God's word or speaking God's word or confessing our faith. We're going to get into that in depth the next chapter. But let me just point us to one scripture here. Could somebody read Hebrews 10 and verse 23, please? Hebrews 10, 23. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope um, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Mm, thank you. So, saying hold fast, hold fast, let's hold on tightly to what? The confession of our hope. Now that word hope, uh, is is uh, is a different Greek word. It's not the word that we use uh, for faith, but it includes elements of that. So it includes expectation, confidence, and faith. So that confidence that we have in our heart, faith. So you know, some versions would translate hope and faith. Uh, so the expectation, the confidence, the faith that we have inside. Hebrews 10, 23 says, hold fast to the confession of our hope. Now, the word confession, and uh, I will explain it, we'll get into it in our next chapter, is an interesting word in the New Testament because many times the word confession is used in relation to sin, and it is, it is applicable, right? If we confess our sins, we use the word confession in that context. But there is also another very important context in which the word confession is used. And it has to do with confessing Christ and confessing his word. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. So this confessing confession of Christ, it's not about confessing sin. 
Now, confessing sin is I do something wrong, I go and tell God. God, I acknowledge it. I say whatever wrong I've done, I ask him for his forgiveness. And that's part of our Christian life. But there is the other side of confession, which is confessing of a faith in who Jesus is and in his word. And Jesus said, if you confess me, I'll confess you. And in other words, there is a connection between our confession of our faith in the person of Christ and in his word and in what he is going to do on our behalf in heaven. When we confess our sins, he in heaven is faithful and just to forgive us. Similarly, when we confess our faith in who Christ is and in his word, or our faith in his word, then he confesses us before the Father. That means he, he's acknowledging that uh, same confession. So Hebrews is telling us, Hebrews 10, 23, and we will look at other scriptures. It says, hold on tightly to the confession of your faith. Don't change this. Don't change well, your faith in Christ or in what Christ promised. Don't change your confession. Now, what is the word confession? It simply means to say something, to say what you believe. You believe in Jesus, so you say. When somebody asks you, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. That's your confession. That's you saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. So Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. That means when you speak of your faith in Christ, who he is, his work, his promise, his truth, when you confess him here on earth, then Jesus said, that's what I'll do up in heaven. And Hebrews is telling us here, yeah, hold on to that confession. So always speak your faith. Always speak your faith. So that's one practice to develop strong faith. Right? Speak your faith in who Christ is and what he has finished on the cross for us uh, in his word. You know, his word is, is truth. So you speak it. So um, that is faith in God. And that's what you remember last time you're we talking about the God kind of faith. That means that's the kind of faith that, that we, we are talking about. The faith that is in God, in his word, in who he is, right? So hold on to that. So in any situation, so example, suppose you run into a situation of financial need. What should you say? Well, you say, the Lord is my shepherd. He will not leave me in want. My God will supply for all my need according to his riches and glory through Jesus Christ. What are you doing? You are confessing your faith in God and in his promise, in his word. That's what the Bible tells us to do. Hold on to that. If you face a situation where, you know, there is sickness, I'm not saying we should deny the sickness. Oh, yeah, sickness is there. How are you feeling? Okay, yeah, I've, I've, there's pain in my body or I have, you know, whatever that, Thing is, yeah, yeah, that's what I feel. That's how I feel. That's, that's that's happening there. I'm not saying deny it. Don't deny the fact that there is a financial need. It is a need. It's there. But in that situation, you say what God said. Father, thank you that you, your word says, by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. Every cell in my body has been healed by the stripes, of, by the wounds that he bore, by the punishment he suffered on the cross. Healing has been provided for my body, every cell of my body. So what are you doing? You're confessing, you're declaring your faith. You recognize the situation, of course. You know it's there, whatever it is, whether it's a financial need, whether it's a healing, whether it's some other problem, whatever. But in that situation, you are choosing to declare your faith in God and in his word. And you'll find this throughout the Bible. We will look at it uh, in the next chapter. The second practice for strong faith is to always maintain a clear conscience. That means 
there should be nothing in my heart that is condemning me. Because the Bible says, if my heart, my own heart condemns me, then I don't have any confidence toward God. I can't be confident toward God. Now, what does that mean? So, basically, if I'm doing something wrong, if I am in sin, if I am doing something that's not right in the eyes of God, my heart, that is my own conscience, is going to condemn me. Saying It's going to tell me. Ashish, what you're doing is wrong. This is not right. It's not acceptable before God. And if I'm under condemnation, having that kind of condemnation in my own heart, then I cannot have confidence or faith toward God. So sometimes it may not, it may not be some big sin as in you know doing something but it could be things like hate or jealousy or pride and it says so so what happens if, if, if there's jealousy in your heart if there is pride if there is competition with somebody comparison if there is uh, 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 hate towards somebody, your heart condemns you. Now, people on the outside may not know it because this is an internal thing. But then inside, your heart is saying, hey, you're jealous about that person or you are, um, you know, you hate that person. Or you don't like that person. You, you know, this, you, your, your heart is not clear. And if your heart is not clear, then can't have confidence toward God or in God. And notice the answer to prayer is connected to this. You know, first John 3, 21 and 22, please, somebody could read that for us, both these verses. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Hmm. Thank you. So, notice how receiving from God is preceded by a clear conscience. Keeping heart clean. So, the secret is keep short accounts. See, we are all human beings. We will all be tempted to feel jealous about somebody, to be proud, to to dislike somebody. To We will be tempted in all these things. We're just human beings. We're in this earth. Temptations will come. But the moment you feel like that, immediately confess it to God. God, I'm sorry. I should not have behaved like that. I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry, I, I was jealous of that person. I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry, I, uh, I was acting very proud. I'm sorry. I, I, was move, I was moving in pride. I'm sorry. Whatever it is, you know, the moment you realize that something is wrong, confess it to God, turn away from it, repent from it, turn away. God, I'm, I don't want that. I don't want that in my life. So when we do that, we're keeping a clear conscience. There's nothing, nothing between you and God, nothing. Clear conscience. And when you have a clear conscience, that is your heart is not condemning you, you can be very confident toward God. You can have confidence toward God. Whether it's a prayer asking, whether it's the exercise of your faith for moving a mountain, whether it's your exercise of faith in praying for somebody, whatever, you can ask boldly. Okay? Now, this is a lifestyle. Like, all, all that we're talking about now is lifestyle. Like, this is how you live um, moment by moment as a, as a believer. I keep a clear conscience. The third thing we want to practice is uh, 
yeah, it's good to look at look at the scripture too. First Timothy one nineteen. It's not here in, in, in the notes, uh, but we can turn in our Bibles and somebody could read that for us. First Timothy chapter one verse nineteen. You can see the connection between faith and a clear conscience. First Timothy chapter one and verse nineteen. Somebody could read it for us, please. Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected, considering the faith have suffered shipwreck. Mm. So it says here, having faith and a good conscience. So not just faith, we are, we are studying about faith. It says, have faith and a good conscience. Like we said, a conscience is not condemning you. Nothing, nothing in your heart. It's clean, it's clean. Have faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected. That means some people have rejected a good conscience. They didn't bother. They thought, okay, I will do whatever I want. I can be angry, I can be rude, I can be proud, I can be this, this, and then I can use my faith. No. What happened here? He says, these people rejected a good conscience. What happened? Then concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. That means they rejected a good conscience. And what happened to their faith? It's like he, he he's using uh, you know uh, a word uh, uh, something from his time Paul's time. He's talking about shipwreck, you know, a ship crashing into a rock, and it's like, or we can use a modern word like accident or a crash. Their faith crashed. That faith had an accident. It uh, you know it needs now it needs rebuilding, needs repair now. So if we reject a good conscience, what does it do to our faith? Our faith will crash. It will suffer an accident. It will, like here he used the word shipwreck. Then you need to repair, you need to re rebuild. So the point uh, this verse is getting to us is, look, in order to have faith, you also need to have good conscience. That means a clear conscience before God, like we are saying. No sin, no wickedness, no evil. Clean, clear conscience. Then your faith will keep sailing. It won't have shipwreck, it won't have an accident, it won't crash. Keep sailing, keep going, keep going. You can keep joining by faith. Right? So, that's the second thing. Always maintain a clear conscience. And like I said, you know, because we all face temptations, it's important. Keep short accounts. The moment something goes wrong, confess it to God. Get right with God. Get out of that sin. Get out of that thing. Walk right before God. Then you can keep sailing by faith. Number three, the third practice is, uh, which is basically what we're learning in this course, is always exercise your faith. That means in every situation, you say, hey, how, what can I do with faith? How can I handle this situation through faith in God? Now, that's how we are supposed to live, right? The Bible tells us we are supposed to be walking by faith or we live by faith. That means everything we do, we have to do it with faith in God. But for us, uh, this has to be an intentional thing. Because uh, we have other options. You know, we can always uh, take care of it ourselves or tell somebody else to take care of it. But you and I choose that while I am responsible, I do what I have to do in the natural. At the same time, we say, you know, what can I do? about the situation through faith. Let me just 
make sure I'm, nobody's outside. Okay. Yeah, Shani just got in. Okay, Shani just got in. Okay. All right. So, or maybe she's trying to get in. All right, let me just stay here for a while and I'll go back to the notes here uh, so that others can join in. Okay. Yeah. So, in every situation, you and I say, what can I do? How can I handle this by faith? Of course, there are natural things that miss the, the actual responsibilities that uh, we have to carry out. By all means, do that. Fulfill your responsibility. Uh, we don't run away from responsibility, so do it. But at the same time, how can I handle this by faith in God? Whatever situation. How can I handle this by faith in God? So that's a third practice. Always use your faith in that situation. Like we said, the you know, I, some of, um, earlier lecture, faith is like a muscle. So the more you use it, the good it, better it is for you, and it it gets stronger. So we have to learn to use our faith. You intentionally go to the Word of God, and you exercise your faith for that situation. Learn to use your faith in God even when things are easy or sometimes things are tough, use your faith. Sometimes things will be easy. It's okay. Still, God, I trust you. I'm still believing in you to give me good success in what I'm doing. I'm still depending on you. So in every situation, your faith is in God and that's how you work, right? So, uh, uh, Divya's question, I see, I just saw it in the chat here, is does this confession also include testimonies one shares? Yes. So anything that you're speaking that declares your faith in God and in his word, things he has done, uh, testifying, speaking, sharing, saying, declaring who God is, his word, his truth, his mighty works, all of that builds up our faith and we don't let go of it. Okay. So number four, so we've, we've seen three, uh, three important uh, practices uh, for maintaining strong faith, right? It's always exercise your faith. Number four is always be motivated by love. Always be motivated by love. And this is something we have mentioned earlier. You know, it says, faith works through love. Faith works through love. That means, if I don't have love in my heart, faith can't work. It can't be productive. It can't uh, produce anything. So I must be motivated by love. Whatever it is, love for God, love for people. So we need to, there are times we may need to reposition ourselves in love. So what do you mean? Because, you know, again, just like what we said earlier, uh, we could just kind of get out of that place of love into doing things by, as a, as a ritual, as a duty, as a, an obligation, whatever. There's no love. You may be doing something, but there's no love in it. So what do you do? Reposition yourself in love. Say, God, I want to do this because I love that person. I want to do this because I love those people. I want to be motivated by love. So it just, it's, just, it's, it's as simple as recognizing that at this moment, I'm not being motivated by love and I need to get back into a place but I can be motivated by love. Simple. Just tell God, God, uh, just, I just choose to do this because I love those people. I want to do it with that pure heart of love. And when you are, when you reposition yourself in love, what? 
vacant work. Okay, so four simple practices for us to maintain strong faith. And let's review before we go forward. Always declare the word of God. We're going to elaborate on that in the next chapter. Second, always maintain a clear conscience. You know, there's nothing between you and God. Keep it, keep your heart clean towards God. Number three, always exercise your faith in God. Every situation is okay. How, how can I handle, what can I do how, with faith here? Yeah. Number four is always be motivated by love. Do it because of love. Okay. So any questions before we get into the uh, next chapter now? Uh, any thoughts, any questions that you have? Everybody with me so far? Yeah, everybody's quiet. So I'm assuming uh, you're with me. Okay, great. Now we're going to get into, you know, just another practical aspect that I want us to understand and, and kind of make it a part of our life, uh, which is that we had just mentioned it in the previous lesson, and we're going to elaborate on it. This is uh, chapter 11, that there are several ways that God has given to us to release faith or to express faith in God. So faith is in our heart. That's wonderful. But I need to express it. You know, when uh, in Mark chapter 2, uh, when we read about these four friends, four friends who brought their fifth friend who was paralyzed. They brought him to Jesus on a stretcher, on a bed. The Bible says Jesus saw their faith. He saw their faith. Why? Because the fact that they would carry their friend on a stretcher, you know, wherever their house was, they would carry him all the way from their, that, that house where he was to this place where Jesus was. And then even though the, the, the house where Jesus was was full, they went up to the roof and, you know, they, those, those roofs, those buildings must have had tiled roofs. So they opened a way and they let the friend down. The very fact that they did all that, the Bible says Jesus saw their faith. So faith has to be expressed or we could use the word exercised or released, you know, whatever word you want. But that means faith that I have in my heart needs to be brought out. It has to be released or it has to be expressed or it has to be exercised. I just use the word release, but you could use any word. So that God sees, God sees our faith. And the Bible teaches us certain ways by which we can release our faith. And we're going to consider them one after the other. How can you express your faith in God? How can you release your faith or exercise your faith? That means, how do you get your faith out of your heart and onto your situations, onto your circumstances, so that it begins to affect things in the natural? How do we do that? There are several ways. We will talk about confession. We'll talk about prayer. We'll talk about praise. We'll talk about action or acting. So these are different ways the Bible teaches us. I'm not saying one is greater than the other. It's just that these are different ways you find in Scripture by which we release our faith or we express our faith. And we need to understand all of them. And in different situations, you may do different things, or you may use a combination of these things. You may confess, you may speak your faith, you may act your faith, you may pray in faith, you may praise God in faith. All these things, uh, you, you know, we may exercise our faith in one or more ways. In the case of these four friends who brought their 
fifth friend was paralyzed, the way they expressed their faith was through their action, through what they did. And Jesus saw that. So that's one way of doing it. We will talk about it. Okay? But let's consider each of these one by one. So the first way to express our faith is by speaking our faith. Simply speaking our faith. That means we use words. We say what we believe. You use words God has given to us. Now that word homologia, the word for confession in the Greek, right, which we just read earlier and we're going to look at some scriptures, homologia. It's a compound word, homo, which means the same, and logia, which means word. So, Say, homo, word. So say the same thing. So confession literally means to say the same thing, to say what God has said. And that's confession. It's just coming into agreement with God with what you're saying. That's homologia. Right? Like, like we did say, there are different contexts in which the word confession is used. And um, we are familiar with what Jesus taught us. You know, he said, if, if you confess me, Matthew 10, 32, 33, you confess me, I'll confess you. And we also understand that we are saved when we confess our faith in Jesus. And we'll be looking at some of these scriptures. So... Let's start in the Old Testament, right? And you find this, this principle of the confession of our faith or the speaking of our faith or by the release of our faith through our words. All of these principles that we're going to talk about, that is speaking our faith, praying, acting our faith, praising God in faith, all of these four ways that actually release our faith, you find it in both Old and New Testament. It's not new. It's not just in the New Testament, Old and New Testament. So we want to look at some of these scriptures. Let's go to Joshua 1, verse 8, please. Somebody could read that for us. Uh, as you can see, my these notes are not yet uh, developed fully, but uh, we should be able to get it done. Anyway, Joshua 1, 8. Could somebody read that for us, please? Joshua 1.8, uh, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Mm. Amen. Thank you. Notice what God told Joshua. Joshua, this book, so up until that time, they had this books of Moses and uh, most probably the book of Job as well. Many scholars say the book of Job was the oldest book. So they would have had these books which were considered sacred scriptures by the Jews. And God is telling Joshua, Joshua, this book, that means this these sacred scriptures that, that, that you have, shall not depart from your mouth. In other words, keep the words of this book always in your mouth. Now, part of it was, you can understand that uh, there were in, in those days, there, were the, there was the oral tradition of communicating truth uh, because, you know, we didn't have, they didn't have the printing press or those mass media resources. So a lot of truth was communicated orally. That's, so that's one part of it. But in the context of what God, the Lord is telling Joshua, Joshua 1.8, it has to do with, you know, he says you meditate in a day and night. So that word meditate is part of it is simply to keep God's word intentionally in your mouth for your benefit. Okay, so it's not a thing about communicating it to somebody else, but this is this word, uh, keep it in your mouth. 
so that you can meditate in it day and night. That means you're fixed upon that. But the word of God is must be in your mouth. You're, you're speaking it. You're speaking the word of God. Right? So we see God telling Joshua, Joshua, this is what I want you to do. I want you to speak my word. Keep it in your mouth all the time. And that's part of the way you're going to meditate in my word. Another very interesting scripture is Deuteronomy chapter 30. So if you just turn over, just flip a few pages towards your left. That's Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we're going to look at verses 11 to 14, please. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Please go ahead. So we can read it. For this commandment which I command you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it. Nor, it is, be nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it. But the word is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. Mm. Thank you. So verse 11 to 14, it's the word. Right? It's about the word. So very simple. So Moses is uh, speaking to the whole congregation of Israel, all the people. And he said, look, God is telling you something. God is saying, verse 11, this commandment, I mean, these words that I'm giving you, they are not too mysterious, not too difficult to understand. And neither are they, is it like far away somewhere? It's not in heaven. Oh, who's going to go up and bring God's word from there? It's not down in the sea. Oh, who's going to go down the sea and fish it out from there? No, no, no. He says, look, the word is very close to you. And the word is in your, verse 14, it's in your mouth and in your heart. So where must the word be? Two places. It must be in your mouth and it must be in your heart so that you can live by it. It must be in your mouth and it must be in your heart. What? The word of God, the promise of God, the scriptures, what, whatever God has spoken. Keep that word in your mouth. What does it mean to keep the word of God in my mouth? It means I say what he said. I speak what he spoke. My words agree with his words. That's confession. Homologia. So God is saying, you keep saying my words. You keep it in your heart. Now, very interesting. The Apostle Paul quotes from this passage that we just read, Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 to 14. He quotes it in Romans chapter 10. So let's go over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And we are going to read, read verses 6 to 10. We'll just read this, then go for our break and come back. Romans chapter 10, verses 6 to 10, please. Somebody? Uh, we can't hear you, Roman. Somebody reading it? But a righteous base on faith says, Do not say in your heart who was sent into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who would descend from the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of the faith. We proclaim because if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. Verse 10. Verse 10. For with, for with the heart one believes, and it is just, and he is justified, and with the mouth one confess, and is saved. Amen. Thank you, Elisha. So, Paul is quoting here, Romans 10, verse 6 to 10. Paul, very interestingly, Paul is quoting that passage from Deuteronomy 30, and he's applying it to a New Testament person, a New Testament believer. So, what we will do is we'll just take a break at this moment, and uh, we will come back right after the break and uh, look into this passage, Romans 10, 6 through 10, because it's interesting. Paul is taking Old Testament scripture passage and he's saying, believers, practice the same thing. Okay? Let's take a break. We'll be back in 10 minutes, please. Thank you.